this we go, but this is 99% English. So, Ariel, would you like to introduce us? Yes, please. All right. So, good evening. As you can tell, this is a this is a different kind of program than some of the lectures we've done before. Um, but I'm so excited to be kicking it off. If you don't know me, my name is Arielle Cates. I'm the director of programming at Village Preservation. Um, we are we at Village Preservation are so glad to be doing um, to be hosting this evening as part of um, FAB's Lower East Side History Month, which you can learn more about at peoplesles.org. It's like a really marvelous initiative. Um, just a little bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more later about how that um, involves the Yiddish Walk of Fame. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We conduct roughly 70 programs a year most of which are free and open to the public, and they are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage and the histories and the value of preservation in our communities. We are a nonprofit membership-based organization, so your involvement and your support mean the world to us. Uh, you can learn more at gvshp.org. So it looks like you all know how to use the chat and the Q&A function. So I am delighted about that. Um, and I will now introduce our guides and interlocutors for the evening. Alyssa Sampson, PhD, is an urban geographer who studies how we actively use the past to create new spaces of migration, memory, and heritage. She's a visiting scholar at Cornell's Jewish Studies program, where she teaches courses on Jewish cities, including New York's Lower East Side. Dr. Sampson's recent publications touch upon Jewish life in the Lower East Side, contemporary Jewish theater, the Triangle Fire commemoration, and much more. She has given many academic and public tours and lectures, um, and has been a consultant on documentaries and for PBS. And Jack Liebewall, who introduced himself far better than I could, is, from what I've learned, a scholar, a lawyer, and the owner of the Second Avenue Deli, which he runs with his family. Jack's clientele can happily attest to his bona fides as a kibitzer in addition to his professional successes. So I am delighted to turn this over to the both of you. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on mute, but if you need anything, just, Give, give me a shout. I'm inviting you right now to take a stroll down the Yiddish of Rialto. So what's a Rialto? It's a theater district, and that's not a word that comes from Yiddish, it comes from Italian. And it's a trading area or a marketplace. And it's named after the Rialto Island of Venice, Italy, which was formerly a center of business and trades. So we're gonna see this evening that trade or in business, which is in Yiddish Geschäft, theater and performance, they travel. And when they travel, they travel in ways that accrete new stories and enrich the older stories and create a new sort of urban fusion. Um, one that is unique in many ways to the Lower East Side and Yiddish theater, but also one that goes on to inform Broadway and Hollywood. So without much further ado, before I introduce you to some of the personalities of yesteryear, I just want to mention something about Yiddish theater. People are interested in it today, not only because it was pretty good, most of it back in the day, but also because it has a type of resonance in terms of its past, in terms of the quality of theater, the issues it dealt with in terms of immigration, and not least, it was often gender bender the Thomas Shevskys, Molly Pekin, a whole bunch of people played different roles. It depended on their age, depending on what role was available. And we'll, we'll see that also as part of um, this discussion of Yiddish theater. And please um, post questions. Ariel will be um, handling them towards the end, but we are definitely online. So, 
So if you look at Yiddish theater and look at these slides, you'll see at the left, it says American Hasidim. This is not Hasidim as we might understand it in Williamsburg or Borough Park or Muncie today. This is a comedy actually, that Maurice Schwartz, who's one of the most famous actors in Yiddish theater, and he's the guy on the right with the Hasidic um, costume from a different production called Yashakal, and that played on 12th Street and 2nd Avenue, and we will be looking at that theater. Um, but he also did a bunch of comedies, as well as the more serious dramas. He ran what was called a repertory theater, or a theater, in effect, a company that did different types of productions at different times, because they had to pay the bills. So they had a stable of productions that they did. And his company was the longest running company in Transjudish theater history. They only folded in the early 50s. So Maurice Schwartz is, is called by people the Prince of Yiddish Theater. And we get an idea with that Yiddish art theater um, poster that he's really speaking to people who know Yiddish because almost all the words except for the theater's name itself are in Yiddish. The next one's from a theater that's on the Bowery because Second Avenue really is not the start in many ways of Yiddish theater, the Bowery is, which is a great entertainment district. And it's also part of Klein Deutschland or Little Germany. Um, so the Talia is a story theater and we see three productions. One is called, um, Shlomo HaMelech, or King um, Solomon. The other is Bar Kochba, which is about a famous rebellion over 2,000 years ago. And the last one's called Kol Nidre, which is the prayer actually one says um, to ask for forgiveness for vows on Yom Kippur. But these were three topics that the Talia uh, actors and uh, empresarials found to be of interest at that point in terms of their audience. Now we're gonna see a different type of modernism, one from the 30s. And we're gonna see marionettes on the top right from Madakot. On the bottom left of that poster, we're gonna see a Clifford Odets play in, Yid in Yiddish that the WPA helped sponsor. And that is called Awaken Sing. But played in English and then it played in Yiddish. We see Baba Yaga, we see Ira Kaminsky, uh, Kaminska, we see, uh, left-wing poster of a magazine called the De Hammer or the Hammer, which is advertising this type of Yiddish theater. But, and then we see a stage, a modern stage with dancers on it and costumes. So we have this really interesting mix of old tastes and new tastes and this hybrid urban fusion that's getting created in the Lower East Side in which Jewish folklore, Hebrew liturgy, modernism, Shakespeare, Ibsen, everything comes into that mix. And because they're immigrants, they're very aware of the theatrical traditions that are in the buildings they're gonna be performing in and of the other groups in those buildings. And we'll look at some theaters and see some of them are purpose built as Yiddish theaters, and others are just really an amazing exercise in adaptive reuse and multiple uses. I'd like to tell you a funny story about Marie Schwartz, because you have this poster there. Yes. At Second Avenue Deli, we have groups that come in to eat there. And one day we had a large group of women, Hadassah women, and a woman comes over to me and tells me that when she was a little girl, she played Alfalfa's girlfriend, Little Rascals. And, but she also had small parts as a child actor at the Yiddish theater. And she told me that she had a role where she sat on Maurice Schwartz's lap and he was singing to her. And she goes, you know what? He had bad breath. What one learns real life. There go the heroes. <laughs> but to your point, Jack, a lot of these people got their start as kids in theater. And that's really interesting. They're immigrant kids. Um, I, don't know if they got, I don't know if they got it as, as a, uh, in the Yiddish theater. They had roles in the Yiddish theater. Here was a girl who played Alfalfa's girlfriend. She was just a little girl. So simultaneously, she was also in the Yiddish theater. Um, 
and when we were, uh, when I was in the deli, one day, oh God, what's his name? You know, you have a bad memory. He played Bat Masterson on TV. Um, oh God, what's his name? A, a famous actor played Bat Masterson, a very, in a very suave person. And he's sitting in the Maui Peak room and he told me he got a start in the Yiddish theater. And, and even um, the actor, who, Leonard Nimoy, played Spock. Right. Some things of the Yiddish theater. Right. We call those people often crossovers, people who can move in and out of Yiddish theater and of American theater, and sometimes film and TV and other types of stages. And Edward G. Robinson is one of them. Paul Muni is another. Molly Pekin, who you mentioned. Um, there are tons of them, in part because kids were thrown in and everybody had to earn a living. That was the particularly main... if you're from a theatrical family. They so... did whatever they had to do. Molly Pekin, by the way, her first language was English, not Yiddish. Yeah, because she's born in America. There's, there's absolutely no question. And we'll, we'll be looking soon at a picture of Molly when she's younger. And um, I would like to hear some of your stories about, about her and your brother's um, devotion as a fan or a patriot, right? As I would say in, in Yiddish to her. So if we're going to think about Yiddish immigrant theater and reading it back, we have to figure out why did it take off like lightning? What is this thing we call the Lower East Side? It's, it's, we have Yiddish as a language that becomes a lingua franca. We have the world's largest Jewish city. We have the densest place on planet Earth. We have mass rapid immigration, a place that's called the Great New York Ghetto. And almost all this happens between 1881 and the assassination of a czar in Russia and the closing of immigration in terms of that immigration. And that happens, the full closing of immigration, as Jack had indicated, happened in the 20s, between 21 and 24. So we have this amazing, rapid, dense migration of people to the Lower East Side and Jews from all over the world meeting each other for the same first, first time. Um, one of the comments mentioned that Jack and Arya Galician is people came from Places like you know Romania, they came from Lithuania, they came from the Pale of Settlement, they came from all over. And so Yiddish grows as a language and it has to, as part of what its growth, it has to accommodate this question of immigration, the immigrant experience and modernism and everything that immigrants are meeting in the Lower East Side. Um, we have somebody who wrote a book in 1902, The Spirit of the Ghetto, Hutchins Hapgood. And he actually wrote a lot in English about the buildings and the actors. And in part because people from uptown were fascinated by Yiddish theater, not least because it had a type of immediacy, a type of vibrancy that they didn't associate with theater uptown. And we have these buildings that get used in many different ways and we'll be taking a look at them as we go down the Rialto here. And we end up with two entertainment districts, the Bowery and Second Avenue. But when we're talking about entertainment districts and theater, we're not just talking about theaters, we're talking about music, entertainment and food and everything else, photography, um, record stores, everything that comes with a the theater district that are with the Rialto. And we're talking about really different and interesting influences musically and theatrically. It could be Tim Penn Alley. It could be silent film and talkies. It could be opera and operetta. It could be art theater. It could be variety theater. It could be slapstick and vaudeville and burlesque. So the antecedents of Broadway come out of Yiddish theater to a very large degree. It is one of the main feeds into Broadway, and we'll look at that in terms of some of these personalities and productions. It's not just a question that Fed will admit into Broadway, um, in Yiddish, finally. But the crossovers give us some insight into that. The musicals do, certainly. A lot of Yiddish theater was musical, but so did the unions. The first, um, the Hebrew Actors Union is the first theatrical union in America, and that's on 7th Street off of 2nd Avenue but also it's a question of staging and the type of modernism and set, stage sets that come with this type of theater. In terms of some of those crossovers, um, 
Paul Muni played Scarface and Clarence Darrow, so he goes crosses into film. Tons and tons of crossovers get their experience here. So the growth of Yiddish theater itself is really interesting. And we could give it a start because all good stories need a start. And we could give it a start um, in 1876 when somebody named Avram or Abraham Goldfaden decides in a place called uh, Yassi, well, which is Romania, that he's going to um, take some songs um, and lines and have them be more musical because that will liven it up in a beer garden and starts publishing. But the problem is this, you still have a czar and czars have censors. So while this stuff is good for beer gardens and for some productions, it's not going to do very well in terms of that part of Europe when censorship is an issue. But by 1890, you already have the stuff of the Bowery. And then, you know, at the turn of the century, we start moving up on Second Avenue. Now, I'm going to start the story in a different place here. And that's on East 4th Street. And it's a little hard to see because it's an old photograph. But it's a building that's associated with La Mama today. And it was called a Tenverein back in the day, or a Turner's Hall. And they were German gymnasts. They had a philosophy. And um, it's a lovely building, historic. And it is a building in which you actually have that first Yiddish theater production. And we're looking at the 1880s, early 1880s, in which a Boris Tomaszewski, unexpectedly, and he is a teenager, a young teen, he's 13, <coughs> an immigrant and interested in theater, but also has a cantorial voice. He gets to have a part and the part, Expectedly is that of a leading lady because the leading lady herself decides that she's not up to um, showing up on stage. The word on the street is that she got bribed by German speaking Jews who were embarrassed by Yiddish. So Boris, whose voice is still rather high, manages to go on stage with a wig and a woman's costume and pulls off something called Kadanya or the witch, this first production on East 4th Street. So actually, the Lower East Side East Village is the home, in some ways, of the American start of Yiddish theater. Since, again, all stories need to have a beginning, we can center ours here on East 4th Street and at the end come back to East 4th Street. Now, one of the most extraordinary statistics that I have ever seen in terms of immigration and thinking about theater is that in 1927, again, this is three years after the gates of immigration have shut. There were 11 Yiddish theaters in New York City and 24 in the US. And in 1937 to 1938, which is during the Depression, we have 1.75 million tickets to Yiddish shows sold in New York. This theater, Yiddish theater packed an audience. It spoke to immigrant life. And it did it through a combination of social realism modernism, expressionism, um, shund, which I'm going to translate as basic garbage, but certainly had its own drawer. And it's going to learn how to do something really interesting, how to Jewishly acculturate something like Shakespeare. Now, for instance, there's something called the Yiddish or King Lear, or the Jewish King Lear. If you just translate Shakespeare, it might not really work for an immigrant. But if you tell the story about a Jewish merchant and his ungrateful daughters, and the merchant has to travel, and the third daughter is the best, you might get a really interested audience. And that is basically what happened with Shakespeare, and to some degree with Tolstoy. Ibsen and Shore, as we see, we're going to see, get actually translated, and, be, and because they're seen as art theater in a different way by a newer generation of immigrants. But we're going to have all these influences that come into the mix, along with the immigrant theatrical productions of Italians, of people on the Bowery who are doing all sorts of uh, different types of work, of people who are living um, and singing Chinese opera, and everything goes into this mix. And it's really interesting. 
So we have these tensions in Yiddish theater because on one hand it has to address immigrants and that means their acculturation and, and also their nostalgia for the past. On the other hand, there's a demand to be artsy and high class quality. And part of the way it's going to do that is through the production of Jewish ritual and plays. And we can see Maurice Schwartz doing that and playing a chassid and a chassidic rabbi. But it also has to portray generational conflict because that is very real in the course of immigration to America. What you have to remember in those days, the early 1900s, probably till about the 30s or 40s, Many of the early stars of the Yiddish theater, <coughs> people who participated in Yiddish theater, were what you call Bundists. Uh, they belonged to the workmen's circle. They were, um, some of them were major communists. In the early 1900s, they would even have, they would have Yom Kippur balls. They were very anti, they were very anti-religious, though, they knew how to perform ritual. And they were somewhat knowledgeable in Jewish things. So Maurice Schwartz could be a, a cantor during the high holidays. Uh, Moshe Oisher, all these people were famous cantors, but they also had, they were in the theater. And they would go from one thing to the other, seamlessly. Coincidentally, yeah. coincidentally, uh, one of the major, he's a, he's a child of some major people who were involved in the Yiddish theater, who were Bundists and everything. He is today a Shomer Shabbos guy, his son's an Orthodox rabbi, his, his children go to, grandchildren go to yeshiva and everything. So it's just very ironic how the generations go on. Yes, and there's rupture and there's continuity, and there is cultural production of knowledge and the expected knowledge for somebody playing a rabbi like Maurice Schwartz or somebody writing about rabbis such as I.J. Singer or um, Sholem Ash, they really had to be very familiar with that religious culture to be able to critique it and to portray it. So we have all sorts of things that show the tensions that Yiddish theater grappled with because it has a mission of both enlightenment and entertainment, acculturation, and reflecting on, a, on how tradition itself is changing. So yes, Jack, I very much agree with what you're saying on that and the types of knowledge that get produced in that world and replicated and shifted and reflected. The, the Singer brothers, were the children and grandchildren of rabbis who decided not to go into the family business, so to speak. Yes, and Yosha Kal, which is Maurice Schwartz's main production, some people think of it as having killed the repertory theater system because it was so successful, he had to play it 300 times in a row rather than rotate it in and out. That was by Besheva Singer's older brother, I.J. Singer who was a better known author back in the day. <clears throat> and yes, they were the sons of rabbis and, and, and famously wrote about ra other rabbis. So just to recap, and that's a picture of Molly Peek on Jack, so you're gonna be cute on that one. Um, we have this unique fusion. It's a product, a creative product of mass urbanization. It's gonna reflect shifting taste. It's a hybrid right? Because it has all these different influences. And we're going to see, at least for adults, we're going to see what might be called transnationalism today in terms of the actors and the troops and the production. And many of these people had no background in theater um, prior to being in theater. Certainly the children didn't. But even as adults, they didn't. They did have a background often in music, however. Jack, do you see that poster of Molly? I can't see it here, uh, but I'm familiar with different Molly Pecan posters. Oh, this one is Emma Stickalib, a true love, the girl of yesterday. Uh -huh. And she's quite young here. This is not the older Molly Pecan. This is the one who's looking for a full on an ingenue. When um, 
at the Second Avenue Deli, we have a po the po different posters. Molly Pecan actually gave them to us. And I, what I found very interesting, one of the posters was for a Yiddish show, but it wasn't on Second Avenue. It was in the Bronx. Yes. And there was a lot of Yiddish theater in the Bronx around the concourse, I guess, because it was a center of Jewish life immigrant Jewish life in those days. We see the same thing in Brownsville as well. Those 11 theaters in New York are not all on the Lower East Side. The Lower East Side is the center. And I think many people um, know the song by Mir Bis Duchesne, which was a big hit back in the day and got translated into many different languages. And that was written by Shavu Segunda. And that song was actually written for a production in Brooklyn in 1932. So the Lower East Side is the hub, but there are lots of spokes. The Bronx is certainly one of them, to your point. So we have New York City's growth that also allows this, these immigrant spaces to, uh, to really take off. It's an, um, you know, New York we think of as this Mecca, it's promised city. It's this place that's unsurpassed back in the day for fashion and labor, but the age of industrialization as much as of mass immigration and mass entertainment. So everything's evolving in tandem very rapidly, very intensively. And it's culturally rich, but economically poor. Three quarters of the Jews in the Lower East Side who are speaking Yiddish, who are immigrants, they're working in the garment trade. And it's not easy work. They're living in tenements. They're in a very concentrated area. And that it's part of where this cultural energy can come out of this. But it's also at the same time in which New York is growing as a city, particularly because of the consolidation with out of boroughs and just generally the opening of immigration to the new um, immigrants. In 1892, you have Ellis Island opening up. And if we start looking at 1880, and 1890 and 1900, as the slides indicate, you start having numbers going up incredibly in terms of New York itself. But the Lower East Side becomes the most crowded place on planet Earth by 1910. And that, again, creates both incredible poverty and hardship, as well as a type of cultural intensity that had never been experienced when people came from all over and end up in one place. And there is, if you will, hybridity of culture, a fusion of culture that happens in those cultural spaces. Also, you, would, you have to remember, it was also a center for crime. Of course. And uh, a lot of street crime, but also many of the crime figures that are legends today came from the Lower East Side of certain parts of Brooklyn that were heavily populated by immigrants. So for example, Bugsy Siegel, from what I'm told, he has a plaque at the Bialystoker Shul. Yes, Benjamin Halevi, yes. The plaque and is the, there, and the, as, as well as the plaque for his father. Yeah, but here's the interesting part. If you look at the date when his father died, his father died of approximately one month before Bugsy Siegel was shot. And the way the story, as I heard it, is that Maya Lansky held up the killing of Bugsy Siegel until his father died. He didn't want his father to be alive when Bugsy Siegel died, was shot. You know, some people have good manners. What could I say? It's considerate. It, it saved the father having to sit shiver, right? Wow. No one wants to be alive when their son or a child dies. That's basically it. And it doesn't make a difference how old the parent is and how old the child is. You don't want to be part of that. That's true. And that's exactly the sort of topic that Yiddish theater could actually address. What it meant to both lose and gain, what it meant to be an immigrant, what it meant to lose one's children culturally or 
as you just indicated, Jack, in other ways. I put here two cartoons from um, a Yiddish magazine called, a Yuma magazine, by the way, called the Grace Kundus, or the Big Stick from 1910. And if you look at the top right, you see it basically says, this is how Jews act in a, a Yiddish theater. And you can see the kid is eating, you know, um, something and the other kids sort of trying to get his mother's attention and people are yawning and this food all over the floor. And then the bottom cartoon shows the same audience in an English speaking theater um, sitting with proper expected decorum. So immigrant audiences certainly were a known item, but there's also the sense that you acculturate into different environments and to expected norms. And audiences were quite lively. Well, I have to tell you, I attended two Yiddish shows at the Anderson Theater on Second Avenue when I was a young kid. And none of us ate there in the theater. <laughs> that is good to know. Your mother <laughs> raised you correctly. <laughs> And you didn't throw popcorn or peanuts at people either, right? Not at all. <laughs> Actually, everyone was well behaved. That is good. But remember, by the 1950s, there was really almost no Yiddish theater. You had the Anderson Theater. Um, once in a while, you had a show on 12th Street until this was burlesque took over. And it ran for who knows how many years until they basically converted the uh, theater into a movie house. Yep. Now, before we get to 12th Street and 2nd Avenue, Marie Schwartz's um, Jaffe Theater, the Yiddish Arts, or the Yiddish Folks Theater, we're still on the Bowery, but something has happened with the Bowery. We're getting purpose-built Yiddish theaters in this beautiful palace on Grand and Christie is built and managed by Jacob Adler and it was devoted to so-called better theater and opens in 1903 but we already have four major Yiddish theaters major companies in which you can have over a thousand people um, or up to three thousand sitting in a theater house and the Talia which we're going to be looking at was a 3,000 seat house and particularly devoted to um, two impresarios and actors, David Kessler and Kenny Lipson. So we have the Windsor, the Peoples, the Grand, and the Grand was managed by Jacob Adler. And we'll also be taking a look at um, Jacob Gordon, who's critical to Adler's um, success because Gordon is the playwright that understands Russian literature and can ad address this question of modernism and social realism. We're looking again about tastes being shaped away from nostalgia, but and moving towards something that would be seen as both more European and sophisticated, as well as reflect an American experience. So Gordon's the playwright, and to you right, there's um, a postcard, and in English it says, the the heroes of the ghetto, but Gordon dies in 1908. So you have basically Gordon um, on top of some tomes of his writings. And he's known for the Jewish King Lear, Merlar Ephros, which is sometimes called the Jewish Queen Lear, God, Man, and the Devil, the Kreutzer Sonata, and many, many other plays. So between Gordon and Adler and this team, you have almost 20 years of what's called the golden age of Yiddish theater. I typically don't use that phrase because I find myself most interested in what happened afterwards in terms of an encounter with modernism in the 30s. But for many people, the golden age really is the Gordon Adler years. And we're gonna see many of these figures persist from that earlier turn of the century immigration. You have Adler and Kessler, who are going to be staging plays by Sholem Ash, who we'll meet soon. By the Thomas, we have Tomaszewski and Schwartz, and he's Schwartz in particular is going to do plays by Sholem Alechem, 
who, by the way, was a big shot as a writer, but not necessarily as a playwright. Um, Bertha Kalish, who's very famous back in the day and introduces audiences to Yudlama Peretz's plays, which are very good literature. And Kenny Lipson, who brings, among many other things, she brings Victor Hugo and Gerhard Hauptmann to Yiddish speaking audiences. Ariel. Hello. Hi, I would like you to introduce Mr. Hapgood's Bowery in the Talia Theater, and that is Hamlet. But is Bertha Kalish is, is actually the main attraction here for Hamlet at the Talia. Ah, yes, I will read this to everyone. The best trained of the three theater companies is at present that of the Talia Theater. Here, many excellent realistic plays are given. The great playwright of the colony, Jacob Gordon, has written mainly for this theater. There, too, is the best of the younger actresses, Mrs. Bertha Kalish. The principal actor at this theater is David Kessler, who is one of the best of the ghetto actors in realistic parts, and one of the worst when cast, as he often is, as the romantic lover. And what about our audience? So we now know that the, that the casting may be a little haphazard from Hap Good's point of view, but um, he likes realistic plays and that's something that it's new to him as an uptown critic. But what does he say about the audience? Okay, into these buildings, cr into these buildings crowd the Jews of all the ghetto classes the sweatshop woman with her baby, the day laborer, the small Hester Street shopkeeper, the Russian Jewish anarchist and socialist, the ghetto rabbi and scholar, the poet, the journalist. Poor working men and women with their babies of all ages fill the theater. Great enthusiasm, enthusiasm is manifested. Sincere laughter and tears accompany the sincere acting on the stage. So this is what any good actor would give their eye teeth for. An audience of the people that crosses almost every boundary. And even people who are poor are going to try to buy tickets because this is the thing to do on the Lower East Side. And frankly, there weren't that many other forms of entertainment. You could do other things on the Bowery, but in terms of the major types of mass entertainment, the theater was it. Fans of actors and actresses were called patrioten or patriots. And in terms of that enthusiasm and the sincere laughter, the story that's told about the Yiddish King Weir is that there was a member of the audience, a patriot of Adlers, who would show up at every performance and the second that it was clear that the daughters, King Lear's daughter, oldest daughters, were not going to help their father when he was impoverished, after he had given away his fortune to them, he would say, don't worry, come, come home with me. My wife is a good cook. Don't worry about those children. That sort of immediacy could be seen as the greatest compliment that Adler had. Also, arguably, Adler back in the day saw this as a little bit of a, a nudnik. Jack, would, would you translate what a nudnik might mean in this context? Uh, what I'm supposed to be doing here today. <laughs> Rather than a kibitza. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Adwa knew to expect the comment, but Adwa was invited home as King Lear. So the Talia, as we just heard from Ariel, was, was the arts theater first, right? And it's down in Bowery. And it's this lovely Greek revival building that keeps on burning down simply because that it was pretty much the history of that part of the Bowery at that time. And it's already built in 1826 for 3,500 seats. It's the largest theater in the US. And it becomes what's called immigrant variety theater, which is very non-PC type of theater that both makes fun of immigrants in ways that are very uncomfortable as well as occasionally insightful. 
But by 1879, we're already in little Germany, Klein Deutschland, and it becomes a German theater. But by 1891, this rapid immigration of Jews from Eastern Europe has happened, and it's Yiddish theater. And by the way, that's followed by Italian and then Chinese vaudeville. And by the time the building actually burns down in 29, it's under Chinese management. And this is a story of theater that's very typical in terms of the Bowery and even Second Avenue. Now, if you look at the Talia, and these are two photographs, one from 1881 and one from 1904, you can see the Talia has a problem because the Bowery itself has changed in the 19th century. And that is the Third Avenue L, and it's cutting the Talia sort of off, so to speak, in terms of the street view and everything else. It changed everything, putting an L or elevated subway up on Third Avenue. It cut new lines, it offered transportation to the outer boroughs and, and to uptown to East Harlem, among other places, and to the Bronx eventually. But it also meant that the Bowery itself started shifting in terms of its desirability as a theater district. Also, the better housing in the Lower East Side was in the 17th Ward, which was north of Houston Street. So these two things start converging. And again, the Lower East Side is just going to become more and more crowded. And it's by 1910 that it hits that population density. Now I'm going to start off here with a figure who's very well known as a Yiddish writer and also as a playwright. And his name is Sholem Ash. And he wrote a play called God of Vengeance, or Gut von Nakama. And he only comes to the US after having been already famous in Europe um, as an established writer. And he comes in 1914. But he's famous in part because he wrote a play, this God of Vengeance, and, and it's produced in 1907 in New York and Berlin. And he tells the story of a brothel. And it's a bra brothel that's in a shtetl or a market town, a small market town. And he talks about acculturation. He talks about religion. He talks about changes of tradition. He talks about what modernity has brought in. And it is a play that is not the sort of play people necessarily would have associated with Yiddish theater until then. It's not a necessarily, um, how would I put this? It, it, it's very direct in, in many ways. And among other things, it has a kiss between two young women, one of whom is a prostitute and the other one is the, um, the daughter of the owner of the brothel. Now the play plays in a number of different languages. It plays in Russian, it plays in German, it plays in Yiddish in the Lower East Side and, and elsewhere. And by 1918, just almost at the point where World War I ends, it actually gets translated into English. But it's not until 1923 that we get a production in English. So one of the th questions that we always have to deal with in terms of theater and music is how do stories travel? How do productions travel? How do troops travel? And in this case, it seems to be somewhat language bound because while Ash's play was controversial in Yiddish, it's not until it hits English in this 1923 production that it's seen as scandalous. And when it's seen as scandalous is, bec is because a German Jewish rabbi, Silverman, who's um, the ex-chief rabbi of Temple Emanuel uptown, goes to court to prevent the production from continuing on the grounds that it was indecent and a scandal. Now, he does eventually shut down um, the production and it becomes a famous court case. Fast forward, go to Yale and Pulitzer Prize winner Paula Vogel, who's a playwright, and she workshops a play about a play and her play is called Indecent. And it is about what happened in 1923 and then it does its own sort of fast forwarding and depicting um, the, the story of Sholem Ash himself. And 2017, the play gone in <coughs> rave reviews on Broadway. I thought now, it was great. 
You thought it was great. Now tell me why, Ariel. Well, I mean, I thought it was complicated, but I thought that it was it was a good production. All of the all of the Yiddish and the projections I thought were like really lovely, um, and it's it's still kind of a racy story, even you know even now. And I thought I thought that they handled that pretty well. Yes. And it's, it's really interesting how you depict that type of sexuality in a play from 1907. There were rumors right? about uh, Sholomash that either he had converted to Christianity or he was, or he was favorable towards Christianity because some of the, a couple of his later works dealt with Jews who intermarried converted to Christianity and so forth. Right. So I would like to address that, Jack. <laughs> Sholem Ash, like the brothers Singer, came from a Hasidic family. He's very knowledgeable. I don't think he flirted with Christianity. What I think he was trying to do in the 30s, he was very, very aware of Nazi and anti-Jewish sentiment. And he was very interested though perhaps not as historically grounded as he might have been, and this question of the fact that Jesus was born into a Jewish family, and he wanted to depict that, and he wanted to depict it sympathetically. And Kahan, Abe Kahan, who was the editor of the forward, read that backwards as meaning that Sholem Ash was interested in, in, in actually converting it from being Jewish. Sholem Ash is the guy who founded the joint. Sholem Ash is the guy who went to Europe in 39 to raise money to get people out of Europe. Sholem Ash was actually a class act. He, um, and that other photo that you see here, the first photo is uh, of, of Ash himself, but the second photo is of an Ash production of film in 1923, uh, sorry, in 1932, of Uncle Moses. And Uncle Moses is one of his Lower East Side plays and books. And Uncle Moses is about somebody who falls, who is the boss's son, who falls in love with the daughter of a sweatshop worker who works for his father. So Ash is dealing with a range of topics in immigration, typically, and modernism. And when he takes that plunge into looking at the history of Christianity, there are a lot of people who don't understand it. And Kahan really went on a crusade, in my opinion, against Ash on that. But I think there's a big jump from saying somebody wants to show the Jewish antecedents of Christianity, whether or not they get it correct historically, <coughs> to saying somebody wants to convert. I remember as a young boy, I went to the library and I took out several books by Sholomash and I brought them home to read. And my parents, I was going to use the word attack me, but they were angry with me. They told me not to read his books because everyone was criticizing Sholomash. And because my parents told me not to read his books, of course, I read them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uncle Moses does not have a lesbian kiss or a brothel in it, per se. <laughs> That's not its topic. <laughs> it's the sweatshop, right? <laughs> and East River, he, he basically has his hero addressing um, a workers' rally and saying, hey, guys, you're here now. You know, you, you can't wait for the sun to set on the, and, and, you know, over Russia and figure out, you know, there's going to be a revolution. You've immigrated. There's tons of stuff about Ash that's really interesting. And not the least of it is that he has a great grandson who helps um, David Mazo, who, who's, who's involved as the editor of the Pock and Trick at the Yiddish Book Center. So Ash is one of these infinitely interesting and productive figures, as Paula Vogel found out, and Ariel's responding to, right? He's interested. And that is the thing about Yiddish theater. It's going to tackle stuff unexpectedly. Now, 
if we're thinking about people who also tackle stuff, but perhaps a little in a diff very different way than Shaul Mash, at the same time period, we have the Tomaszewskis. And what I have here is a, um, the opening program from when they opened their theater on where basically where Whole Foods is now on Houston Street and Christie Foresight. Um, and that theater was called the National Theater and it's opening in 1912, as you can see here. And in terms of modernism, look, look at that little capital. Isn't she lovely with that face, right? Um, but you can see it as a parquet and a balcony and a second balcony, it's an enormous theater. These people are not only tackling modernism, but they're also tackling business as family businesses often, right? Because they're their actors, they're also the impresarios, they're the directors. And if they have a kid who's not talented, that's, that's called the kid who counts money at the box office, right? Because somebody has to do the books. Um, and Bessie and Boris are really interesting because Boris never really fully learns English as a native speaker. Um, Bessie and Boris, after Boris had already learned to play ladies' parts, he played in Philadelphia and Bessie was a teenager in the audience and she went back to meet the leading lady and she went to his dressing room and realized the leading lady was actually a boy based her age, they elope and they become the most famous couple in Yiddish theater. But Bessie is also a really interesting class act in her herself. They're not only, they act together, they eventually get divorced, they have children, all this other stuff. But if you look at the costumes on that Bessie Tomaszewski post, poster, you can see she played everything. She did all the gender bender stuff and she played boys often. So you have both of them crossing lots of interesting artistic boundaries. Um, arguably the ego was bigger for Tomaszewski who thought he was very handsome and liked to wear a, a garter, especially if he played Hamlet. Um, Michael Tilson Thomas, the conductor, um, is their grandson. And in 2005 at Zankel Hall, he did a production about his grandparents, but it really was in many ways an ode to Bessie. Now, Second Avenue starts taking off because David Kessler in 1911 builds his theater on Second and Second. And then you have Tomaszewski building on Houston Street. And all of a sudden you start getting these theaters moving up Second Avenue. And as opposed to the Bowery, which is now covered with train tracks, look at this picture of Second Avenue. You can see how open it is. You can see the cars and the, and the trucks in there. Um, no horses in this picture. But you get a sense that it's a place that things are happening. You see theaters, you see movie theaters as well as stage theaters. You see a couple of storage places in this. Um, we have also the public theater, AKA the Phyllis Anderson, that's just up the block on 4th Street. That's the one Jack you spoke about. And we get the Jaffe Theater happening on, or the Yiddish Arts and Folks Theater on 2nd Avenue and 12th Street. And we'll be looking at that shortly. We also get across the street from the Jaffe Theater, Cafe Royale. And Cafe Royale starts also in this period, the first decade of the 20th century. And it is very famous. Some people call it central casting. Um, Joe Papp eventually does a production about called Cafe Crown about the Cafe Royale. Joe Papp is called an angel or a malach of Yiddish theater. He's very interested in this stuff. And that becomes important in the 60s, but it also becomes important in the 80s and the 90s. Um, but Cafe Royale is famous in and of itself because it's the place everybody hangs out. Central casting, why? It has one phone. And if people wanted to get an actor, they basically called. And they said, looking for somebody who can play an old rabbi, looking for somebody who can play a young woman or whatever else it was that they were looking for. It also was famous because it had somebody called Herman the busboy who was a busboy who was rather aged, um, spoke German and English, did not speak Yiddish, wasn't Jewish, um, and who insisted on a nickel tip, but a nickel tip was considered a good investment by him. He ended up with some money and he loaned it to actors, but it also was a good investment for an actor who wanted to make sure that they got the phone. Jack, you once told me a story about the second AFU Delhi in regard to the name Cafe Royale. A uh, Fyder Schwinkel told me this story that he used to go all the time to the cafe there 
because that's where you went to look for work. Mm -hmm. And if you were unemployed, you went there. This way people saw you and they, th and he was in your hope that they would think of you for a role. Now remember, Fivish Finkel was at the end of the Yiddish theater already. Yes, but he's also a crossover because he's born in the States and he's born in Brooklyn and Brownsville. Correct. He's English, he's native, and he makes it into film and but stage. As the way, the way he said it to me, I became a star after I was too old to enjoy it. <laughs> and, but he, he was he, basically, he was brought up at the, the end of the Yiddish theater uh, the old time Yiddish theater people did not think highly of him as a Yiddish actor. When my brother did the Walk of Fame on second, you know, right in front of the Second Avenue Deli on 10th Street. So my brother wasn't that familiar with all the old time Yiddish actors and actresses. So who did he speak with? The Hebrew Actors Union. Seymour Rechtzeit, the other people there, and the, all the names of the actors and actresses, they gave it to him, and he put in plaques for all of them. And for a number of years, Fivish Finkel would not talk to my brother because he was very angry that his name was not on one of the plaques. And my brother said to me, what do I know? I went to Seymour. I asked him. He told me what to do. And they did not think highly of Fiber Shrinkle because they thought he wasn't really part of the Yiddish culture. Right. And so actors can be snobs too. And getting into the Hebrew Actors Union was basically a guaranteed income for many people. And it was prestigious, but more people were left out than were let in the door for that union. And Fivish eventually got a star, and he got a role in the Dybbuk, the movie. <laughs> so, you, 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 you know, there's, there's an expression, revenge tastes good, you know, cold sometimes. They uh, were, I remember a conversation, um, it was with Lillian Lux, Pesach Burstein's wife, mm -hmm. Mike Burstein's mother. And we were talking at the deli, and we were talking about the, the plaque for Fivish Finkel. And she goes, he finally got his plaque, now he's happy. <laughs> yes, that makes sense. He has a store, it's in granite, it's in front of the deli. What more could you ever want, right? <laughs> now, Maurice Schwartz was seen as integral to Yiddish theater. For, by many generations. Again, he has the longest run repertory company in New York, in the, in the, in, or actually in the world in terms of Yiddish theater. And Louis Jaffe loves Schwartz enough that he builds this Yiddish art theater for him. And, Mr. and Maurice Schwartz is called Mr. Second Avenue, but look at the size of it and look at this style. It, it's, you know, in landmark filings, and it's an interior landmark, it's called um, Neo Moorish, but I call it Deco Semitic because it's just so over the top, and we're going to see a f some photographs very shortly. But you see this building back in the day, it's an L shaped building, and where the entrance is today for the cinema is actually wasn't the main entrance that was actually on 12th Street then. But in 1926, again, after the gates of immigration had closed, this thing gets built and it has a film studio in it. It has a place for, to buy flowers and sheet music. And it is a, over 1,700 seats. And it's an absolutely amazing building. Now, of course, the time, the question of timing is everything because the depression comes and it's hard in normal times for actors and troops to earn a living. So during the depression, it gets a little harder, but the building is gonna be doing its own recycling. Um, one of the things that happens is we get the Yiddish Folk Theater, and that's from 26 to 45, mainly under Schwartz and revivals. And as you had also had mentioned, um, we end up with burlesque and many other things there, Casino East, right? But before that, we had that- La Mancha got its opening there. Yes. That's the whorehouse in Texas got its opening there. Yes, and oh, Calcutta and Greece 
had its opening there. So once you have a theater district, it remains a theater district. It may be an off-off sort of theater district in terms of the Broadway designations, but it's still a theater district. If you go to the building on 2nd Avenue, right off the corner, the bottom part on the wall there, you will see in Hebrew letters the year, the Hebrew year that the building was established. Yes. I will show a picture of that in a, in a minute, Jack. And also, Mrs. Shaul Malachim, as she was known back in the day, as the one who, who laid that cornerstone in 26. Now, the picture that you have here is sketches of the characters, the various characters from Yosha Kalb. And you, can just, and you can see just how beautifully they're drawn and what these costumes were like. Yiddish theater wasn't Yiddish theater if you didn't have a cast of 50, typically. Um, and you had many people involved in the production, not the least set designers and costumers. It's an interior landmark today. And if we look at these pictures of the ceiling and balcony, this gives you an idea of why. In 1993, uh, it was designated as such. It's very unusual in New York City. And that's actually a Star of David on that ceiling. In the, in the main viewing room. If you also look at that little uh, window, it's not a lancet window, it, that is Neil Moorish in terms of evoking sort of a, a Cordoba sort of impression. But look at the, this with the polychrome and the colors here. It's absolutely amazing. And so what you see in a theater like this is something that's very much affected by um, a movie sensibility of palaces of pleasure. Theater and movies competed with each other and were synergistic. And many of, this, many of the same people did design for both. Um, certainly in terms of the architects, certainly in terms of interior designers and ter in terms of set designers. It was a lot of fluidity in terms of the use in the, uh, of these buildings and how they get built and the sort of motifs that they reflected. So these palaces of pleasure really had to sort of be a little bit over the top and yet send a clear message. And in this case, um, the Star of David, I would say, and the Neo Moorish is very much associated with the Jewish message here in terms of looking back at the past, but moving towards the present. Here's some more of these interiors. And you can see over uh, what's now exit signs, you can see again, polychrome. Um, this is painted rather than stone, real stonework here. Oh, and I should actually say, it's also worth looking at the balcony. People used to climb onto the balcony to see and be seen. That was a good way to, it was considered to, to meet people. Um, if you look at the stage itself and the arch, again, it's absolutely amazing. When you know, we talk about curtain calls and the opening curtain act, this was a very big thing. And this is what Jack was talking about. This is the month of seven, May 23rd, 1926. This is the cornerstone at the bottom of the building at, at the, next to the main entrance today. And this is where Mr. Shalom Alechem actually was there to help dedicate it. The photo to your left, um, I don't know if anybody here remembers the Rocky Horror Picture Show, but for many years, you could see it at midnight in this building as well. And that's reflected in that window. More contemporary views of the building. You can see the Tribeca Film Festival, people walking outside, but you can see these large windows and arches. Um, the one to the left shows you that the arch actually has two menorahs or candle operas in it, right? And they're absolutely stunning. Now, the same architect that created um, that theater also created something called the Commodore, the Los Commodore. And so we have two Yiddish theaters going up the same year, plus um, the public. So three, really three Yiddish theaters on Second Avenue coming up in 26. And the Los Commodore is also an L-shaped building by Harrison Wiseman. And it gets bought very rapidly, even though it's actually a film building and it's bought by Marcus Lowe, as in the Lowe's um, theater chain. He also has Lowe's Canal. 
He's actually a neighborhood boy from Avenue B on 7th. And the theater itself gets associated with Yiddish theater, as well as a number of other things. So it's the Yiddish Village Theater, but it becomes the Fillmore East than the Saint. And now it's the Immigrant Savings Bank. So we're gonna take a, a little bit of a whirlwind tour to see what that looked like back in the day. That's again, when it's the Lowe's Commodore. And after, the building next to it is actually the Salzbur Saul Burns building. And that building is uh, Central Plaza, which is actually a place which had many uh, productions, st studios, but also before that was a very well-known Lower East Side Catering Hall, also the site for um, Sal Burns' phonograph business. And that is a story in of itself. So here is a collage that you can see in the lobby of that bank building today, the Immigrant Savings Bank. And you can see Meter and Ben, uh, you know, Ben Bonus is her husband, Mina Burns. And you can get a sense of what this was like as a Yiddish theater. To the right, you see what's called a Goldie or a, a gold Faden statue. It's an award the Hebrew Actors Union used to give to uh, a top actor each year. And this is Mina Byrne back in the day on the left. There's a little um, statue, or, or rather a bust of, um, Avram Goldfaden, the founder of Yiddish theater um, at the Hebrew Actors Union on a table, the uh, photo I took a number of years back, and of Mina Byrne at her 98th birthday. And you can also see, though I know the writing is hard to read, um, Mina, Berner, Mina Byrne and Ben Bonus's name in stone and granite in front of the, of the Second Avenue Deli location on Second Avenue and, and 10th Street. Now, for those who are interested in the 60s, we have something a little different, which, was, which is when the building became the Fillmore East. But before it becomes the Fillmore East, we have Dr. Timothy Weary here and the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Yes, so the 60s was a very interesting moment in the neighborhood. You could also see Ratner's just down the block because Sal Burns building had Ratner's in it. And though it's very hard to read, on the same Lowe's Theater marquee, you can see actually it says vaudeville, Yiddish vaude American vaudeville and films. So all this is happening. Timothy Weary is in the same building as Yiddish American Vaudeville in the early 60s. We get to the Fillmore East in 68, when Bill Graham, who's actually a Holocaust um, refugee, um, comes to the States the hard way as an orphan, um, has taken over the building. And you can see that Laura Nero and Miles Davis are playing there as are the Grateful Dead. These are th very famous photographs. Uh, I don't know, Ariel, if you want to speak to them, but they are photographs of when the building next to the Fillmore burnt down. Um, and that's the corner of 6th Street and 2nd Avenue. But you can see the crowds outside. And then you can see that Fairport Convention and um, Jethro Tull and many others are playing at the Fillmore in the same period, as well as Neil Young and Crazy Horse and Joe Cocker and, and the Moody Blues. I recognize some of these photos as Amelie Rothschilds. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, this one on the left, she told me that she showed up for work one day. She worked with the I think she worked with the Joshua Light Project. She told yes. me that she showed up for work and saw this huge crowd and just knocked on the door of the apartment building across the street and they let her up onto the roof of the building so that she could take that photo. Wow. Wow. It is an amazing photo. And it gives people a sense that there's actual street life in the Lower East Side, even as it was burning down. But it also gives people a sense that this L-shaped building, which we now know was really, a, you know, the Immigrant Savings Bank, was mainly located on 6th Street rather than 2nd Avenue, because you can see that it is an enormous theater. 
and you can see the fire escapes on it and get an idea of what some of those interiors might look like. So here's a little bit more and you can see the sign for Ratners and on the who was playing that night. And now we get the interior of the Fillmore East and you can see the balcony and you can see the presenting arch and you get a sense of the grandeur that Harrison Wiseman created here. But speaking of the Joshua Light Show, you can also get a sense of the crowds and the energy that Bill Graham and others brought to this place, which was the, the, the place to hear music on the East Coast. Arguably. That was short lived, remember that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And here's more from the Fillmore East, including a poster in which you see the Bill Graham presents in New York. And you can see the Joshua Light Show again. And this is from Wolfgang's Vault. But you can also see the arches and the interior and the, and the columns and, and, and everything else here. Now, I've really fast forwarded in time because you get the film, after the Fillmore East, you get the Saint, which is a gay nightclub and also had an amazing interior that's over the top and light shows. And you can see how that interior gets used. So these buildings keep on and they're adaptive for use, even when, when they stop being Yiddish theaters per se. Though as Jack indicated with Maurice Schwartz's building, that persisted far longer. Today, if you go down Second Avenue, and I, 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 I say that cautiously, um, socially distance way, you can actually perhaps have an intimate encounter with Jim Powers mosaics. And if you look at what Jim Powers has memorialized in these mosaics, which initially came out of found objects in the Lower East Side and went up on street um, posts and lamps and, and, and other places that NYPD and the fire department did not find necessarily to be of interest in terms of um, the decorative approach to the arts, though now they're valued. We can see that George Burns and Gracie Allen are memorialized here. The Minsky brothers are too, and that's burlesque. Janice Joplin is memorialized, this is J Jimi Hendrix, and of course the Fillmore East itself. And lastly, what we have here is the way the Yiddish theater looks today. You can still see the Lancet windows at the bottom. You can still see the Sal Burns building just to the north or to the right. But we basically have an immigrant savings bank building and the traces of the Yiddish theater can be seen on top where you still can see that there is a face, a theatrical face welcoming us today. Ariel? Hello. Would you like to ask questions or have oh, yes, people we post have, them? We have many questions. Also, um, at Barbara's suggestion, I don't know if you're still here, Barbara. Um, if you if you want to ask a question, um, I think I can allow you to talk. But let me first go through the questions that have been typed to us. Um, Jeffrey wanted to know, um, did the Man of La Mancha open at Joe Papp's um, public theater? And if you know where, where the, was the public theater always the one that's on Lafayette and Astor? I'm going to take well, part of that and Jack will take part of that. So there are two public theaters that are not connected. <laughs> there's one on 2nd, right, and 4th Street, and then there's Joe Papp's public theater. So they both have the same name, but they're not the same building and they're not the same troops and people. The public theater on the Bowery, from uh, what I was told, was where the Hayas was. That's the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And it, uh, when immigrants came to America, the Hayas put you up for 
short period of time until you found your own place to stay. And the public theater is where uh, the Hayas was located at that time, right after World War II. I remember talking with my brother. He had an apartment on a high floor from the, at the Stewart house. And I'm in his, we're in his apartment and I had just bought my apartment a block away. And we looked out of his window, we could see the public theater. And I said to my brother in Yiddish, look at this. We're in this country over 40 years and we've only moved a couple of blocks. Because when your family first came to America, you were at the highest, right? We were at the, we were at the highest. They, they put us up. I mean, without them, I don't know what would have been with us. And right. Hyas is still doing incredible work around the world, helping immigrants and refugees. Yes, they're very much a lively organization today, and they were very lively back in the day. Um, one of the, it was the, um, the public theater that Joel Papp was associated with, which was in the Hyas building, was also before that the Astor, the John Astor, uh, Jacob Astor Library. And Pap himself was interested in Yiddish theater. I remember one of the best productions I ever saw in terms of neighborhood Yiddish theater was Songs from the Garden of Eden that, uh, and that Pap had a, at the public theater that was produced uh, there. And Pap was known in Yiddish theater as a malach or an angel, which is a Broadway sort of term. Now, Jack, I think you will also ask about the Man from La Mancha, which was at the Jaffe or the Yiddish Folk Arts Theater. Correct. Was I did not know that. Okay, okay, next in line. Okay, so um, when, when you were... Okay, somebody wanted to know what the address of the Moorish Theater is. Uh, 180, I think 191 to 196, Second Avenue, the Neo Moorish Theater, uh, the Jaffe or the Folks Theater. Yes. Just, I just know it is 12th Street and Second Avenue. <laughs> oh, I've got this slide I'm going to put up. Hold on one sec. We'll share this with you while I while we talk. Um, okay. More questions. Let's see if I can make this full screen. Ah, but when I do that, I can't see the questions. All right, folks, bear with me. Okay, so let's see. Oh, I can answer this. Yes, the Fillmore, the building that's in the Fillmore East is now, how do I do this? Sorry, y'all. I think it's a supermarket, if I'm not mistaken. It's a, it's an Apple bank, but if you- It's an, it's an immigrant bank and an Apple, uh, Apple bank, yes. If you go into the lobby, there's a um, there's like a little exhibition about about the Fillmore East, and I believe that the section of the building that was the theater is now apartments. It's it's some of the ugliest apartments in the Lower East Side in the East Village. Uh, basically, they they cut the L-shaped building off, put up um, cheap quality but expensive price ha housing there and um in effect the f the front of the building on second if you became the bank and there's a, and in the lobby you have the six collages that give you the sense of the history of the building got it okay more questions um jeffrey wanted to know if the theaters had marquees and if the if the plays were named in English and in Yiddish or just in Yiddish or what did it's, that look like? Um, I showed some pictures with marquees. People had to do some English because it, it was necessary. Um, it's like theater posters. If I 
chose randomly a dozen theater posters, you would have a mix of English and Yiddish, and you couldn't know in advance what the mix was going to be and what the predominance was going to be in terms of language. Also, sometimes English gets transliterated directly into Yiddish. You need the words English, right? Afternoon, right? Something like that. You know, performance. Um, but the the letters will be Hebrew letters, which is what uh, the Hebrew language alphabet, which is what Yiddish uses. So you're going to see both. But if it's a big name, like, you know, Adler's, you know, name, it went up on the marquee. Now, the Jaffe Theater is a little different. They're trying for something classier in a different way. It's a different sensibility, right? It's more architectural. Um, so they're not, they're not going to put the, that marquee up in the same way. Got it, got it. Um, Norman wanted to know if you can talk a little bit about how the identity of the neighborhood changed from the Lower East Side into the East Village, which are, are we even allowed to say the East Village? Well, you know, you know, the one thing I will never say is Alphabet Town, to be honest. But East Village is really late 50s, early 60s. And it's and, and it's contradicts. By the way, even seventies or even seventies. Right, but 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 it, its origins are earlier. There's the East Village Other, for instance, in the late fifties that it's already published. You have Umbra, which is you know one of the antecedents of the Black Arts Movement happening on Second to Fourth Street in in particular. Um, you have the Beats poets that have come in already, whether it's Kerouac or, or Ginsburg and many others. You have David Henderson. So you start seeing the use of the East Village to, do, to because the Bowery starts extending down. In effect, the Bowery used to be a, a line you, that, that separated the Lower East Side from the rest of Manhattan. It used to be the Western boundary, but it really stops being the Western boundary then. And people start crossing the line for the cheaper rents, the more bohemian atmosphere. Also happens because abstract expressionism is an artistic movement, which is located Bowery, 10th Street starts needing cheaper rents and a different sort of artistic milieu. One we might associate more with jazz, for instance, and poetry. Okay. Oh, Sandy says that she remembers the Man of La Mancha opening east of Washington Square. So that tracks. Yeah. Um, and there may be people here who remember Old Calcutta. Oh, Mitchell. Uh, Mitchell wants to know, Alyssa, can you tell us about your background photo? Oh, okay. So I am a fan of Rebecca Lepkoff. She was a photographer, um, photo week photographer, grew up in the Lower East Side in a place called Cherry Street, which was very poor. And when Lepkoff got a camera from the photo week and was taught how to use a dark room, she photographed a neighborhood, which is what a lot of people did from the photo week because they worked with teenagers and, and younger people. And so what she's interested in in this particular photo, it's a little hard to see, is kids playing in the streets. That's what you did in the Lower East Side. Hey, kid, go play in the streets, right? So they're playing and they're playing with basically the things you played with, which is wheels, wagons, um, push carts, um, the tops of sewers. And it's from 42. Amazing. Okay, just, just a, a few more questions. Vicky wants to know, did Fanny Bryce perform in these Yiddish theaters? Fanny Bryce did. She's like Marcus Lowe. It's really interesting. Occasionally you get, you know, people come from a German Jewish background who deal with the Lower East Side because the Lower East Side is the site of entertainment. So Fanny Bryce certainly performed, but she's performing in English. Um, Sophie Tucker famously performed, but she does my Yiddish mama. She's born in America, but she actually did have a Yiddish mama and she sang it in France at some point in which, um, it got a lot of attention, both positive and negative, um, given anti-Semitism in France at that moment. Um, and so you have figures that are important to entertainment and entertainment history that get associated with the Lower East Side, even though they're really English speakers, and Bryce is one of them. Got it, got it. Cool. Okay, so... 
We have this question from Joshua, which is, you mentioned how indecent portrays the conflict between the uptown German Jewish community and the downtown Eastern European Jewish community. And one of the striking things about Jewish King Lear is the way that it portrays the son-in-laws as a Litvak and a Hasid, mm -hmm. with the former a bully and the latter a drunk. Can you talk more? <laughs> That's like, pretty accurate. I, I like this assessment very much, yeah. Can you talk more about how intercultural conflict was represented in Yiddish theater? Well, it gets, intergenerational conflict gets represented in many different ways. One of which is ultimately, what is the loyalty to the parents, right? And we see that in the forward in Kahan and the Bintel briefs, right? And, and the letters that people write or the Kahan writes. So people think they're writing letters, right? Um, it asks, for instance, you know, I'm a good socialist, I wanna get married, you know, but, but, you know, but my parents want a religious wedding. Kahan is predictable in these answers. He's always going to say something like, for the sake of the parents, find a rabbi, right? He's also predictable that, that whenever anybody asks about education, whether a parent or a child, he's going to say, get the kid the education, even if it makes the, you know, even if it's going to force sacrifice from the family. But the intergenerational conflicts are also, they're not always smooth, smoothed over in Yiddish theater or the Yiddish press. Very often, for, for instance, there are even Haggadahs in which the wicked child is shown as somebody who becomes a capitalist or somebody who, who, who spurns tradition or the, the depiction of the wicked child offers a lot of um, food for thought in terms of are your children going to support you in your old age? Are they going to listen to you? Are they going to respect you? It's not a question of a Mother's Day card. It's, it's a question of valuing immigrant parents in a place in which immigration is seen as this mixed baggage if you want to become American. Yeah. The jazz singer depicts that, for instance, and it has its own resolution, which people could be comfortable or uncomfortable with. Okay. Sorry. Intracultural, okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Maybe one more question from Ronald. What became of the company whose home was the National Theater on Houston and 2nd Avenue that was torn down for a subway stop? Ro that's, Bar that's Boris Tomaszewski's National Theater. And Tomaszewski does die. This happens to people um, who are, you know, aging Yiddish actors. But, but basically, the, the, the theater falls apart as a troupe before then. Tomaszewski has a hard time making transition during the WP era where he gets subsidized into doing an English language play, even though he's a child immigrant and younger than many of these other people who do cross over into English even as adults. Um, and, but he makes a successful transition to Yiddish film and he still has a stunning voice. So there is good Yiddish film footage of Tomaszewski, not simply back in the day, but as, a, as an older actor. Um, but the troupe falls apart and eventually the building gets torn down. And it was a beauty. I'm not sure what year this was. Mike Burstein told me a story that he, he was going to be bar mitzvah. His father was Pesach Burstein. And he didn't want to make a big bar mitzvah party because it cost a lot of money. So what he did was on Houston and Second Avenue, um, and has, that has to be the theater. Yeah, but it's the theater sure. there, yeah. He did in that theater, he made, he put on a show and he told Mike, this is your bar mitzvah party, charged admission for the theater, and he kept all the money himself. <laughs> <laughs> Immigrant parents. What could I say? It was hard to earn a living as an actor, right? Or as an impresario. <laughs> and if you had kids especially, who were talented, you might as well take advantage of it. Especially of the Yiddish actor. They did not make a living. No. No. They, they, you know, Molly Pekin, in part, was a 
class act, not only because she was an actress and an impresario and a crossover and a gracious human being, but she went to Warsaw right after World War II with her husband, Jacob Kalish, and she did Yiddish theater in courtyards, right? Using she, sheets as curtains was a class to, enter, to entertain people after the war because she knew that they needed something to connect to, whether it was a song or a story. So a, some of these people are very classy. She was a real class act. She was on The Tonight Show, and she had written her book. Uh, we had named the, second, the room of the Second Avenue Deli, the Molly Pecan Room, the new edition. And she's on The Tonight Show. And she's on with Helen Hayes, and she turns to Helen Hayes and says, so what's the big deal that you have a theater named after you? I have a room at the Second Avenue Deli named after me. And she probably got a better sandwich out of it, too. <laughs> so I have a couple of things that I just want to say really quickly about the Yiddish Walk of Fame. Um, and then maybe, well, I don't know. What do you think? I feel like the two of you can probably speak to it better than I can. But I, Ariel, I have, give, it, give, it a, give it a try. Okay. <laughs> we'll be your prompters. You can, you can, you can supplement. Um, so this is, I'm just... It's like, it feels, it feels very, um, it feels very formal, but my colleague Harry, who is uh, Village Preservation's director of East Village and Special Projects, couldn't be with us tonight, but he wrote this for me to say to you, so I'm, I'm going to read this. The Friends of Abe Liebewall Yiddish Theater Walk of Fame group formed to preserve and protect the Walk of Fame in some appropriate way. As you may or may not know. In the 1980s, Second Avenue Deli owner Abe Liebewall installed this memorial to honor the stars of the Jewish theater scene we just learned so much about in the sidewalk outside his beloved restaurant. In the style of the Hollywood Walk of Fame, he embedded two rows of granite stars, which bear the names of some of the best and brightest Yiddish theater performers, composers, playwrights, including the Secunda family and, and a number of others who we've been talking about this evening. Um, so now, if you've walked on 2nd Avenue between, it's 11th and, 11th and 12th, right? Nope, um, Ten, on the corner of 10th Street. 9th and 10th, yep. there you go, there you go, okay. Southeast corner. Yep, thank you. Um, if you've walked by there, you, you can see that this, this um, walk of fame is deteriorating. So the Friends of Abe Liebewall Yiddish Walk of Fame is working now to promote the history and culture of Yiddish theater and to protect and preserve the granite stars that were embedded in the sidewalk. So we at Village Preservation are really proud to be working with um, fellow stakeholders with the involvement of the Liebewall and the Secunda families um, to secure the future of this piece of our neighborhood history. So you can learn more. Oh, I'm also supposed to say um, many of these efforts are thanks to our partnership with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, who has convened a task force for this important issue. So we're, we're working with her on this as well. Um, and if you want to get involved or if you want to learn more, you can go to gvshp.org slash Yiddish, which I'm going to put this link in our chat right now. Um, and now I will turn it over to you, Alyssa and Jack, to say anything you please about the Yiddish Walk of Fame. I um, think that Jack is the better interlocutor because his brother actually established it. I remember when my brother got the idea, he went to see Morechtzeit and a few other people from the Yiddish theater, and he discussed with them the possibility of doing the Walk of Fame, and they just did it. Um, actually, what's interesting, the person who actually installed it were the, uh, the Jewish monument people. What you do as monuments and, and cemeteries, those are the plaques that you have there. And they, um, 
They put, they installed it in the sidewalk. We never got permits from the city. The interesting part was uh, the mayor showed up for the installation. And I was joking with my brother, wouldn't it be funny if while the mayor is speaking, an inspector comes and gives a violation. And uh, of course, no inspectors ever came. I remember we had another uh, session there where we put in five ish Finkelstone. The governor came. No one cared. It was the, it, we, just, we just did it. However, when we closed down Second Avenue in Delhi and we opened up on 33rd Street, we wanted to move the plaques to 33rd Street. And we found out that there were two problems. Number one, we now we would be required to get permits from the city to remove it and then to install it. And just dealing with the New York City bureaucracy was so difficult, we just gave up on that. And it's a very expensive proposition to restore the plaques because it's not going to last too long. And if you try to move it, it's a Herculean task because of the weight and everything. Yeah. Now, I, I'm going to differ slightly with Jack on that. Human beings are designed for Herculean tasks. It's not a Sis Sisyphean one. These people that we've been talking about, Maurice Schwartz, Leanna Lux, Shovel Mash, Avram Goldfaden, Bessie Tomaszewski, their history and what they gave to Second Avenue and to theater is part of our lives today. You can't go and see a Broadway production without knowing how it sets and often its musicality comes straight from Yiddish theater. So in the place that was its home, it would be good to remember it. Let's see, you were so right. I can't tell you how right you are, but someone has to pay for it. Yeah. And basically yeah. what it means is people have to come up with the money. There's a saying in the Talmud, ain't kemach, ain't Torah. No flower. No Torah. No Torah. It means you need money. Right. Without All right. money, you're not going to have Torah. It also says ain't Torah. But, ain't but, but Jack, we're here to... All right, Jack, we're here to answer questions rather than to snore money. <laughs> and, if anybody, <laughs> yeah. and if anybody needs to have a translation on that, find me afterwards. <laughs> uh, now, Ariel, I have a question. Can you see my screen? I can, yes. What do you see on it? I see your PowerPoint. All right, but what does it say? Forward and back. Okay, so just very briefly, these are just some of the top-notch productions in Yiddish that I have seen in the last two decades in the Lower East Side and the East Village. Um, Dead Center, does anybody recognize him? His Mandy, Mandy, there's a film. <laughs> Tinkin? I can't believe it. Well, he was younger once, Jack. Come on. <laughs> Give him a break. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Mandy Patinkin is here, right? And he was at the Orenson Center. And he debuted there with a production that eventually made it to Broadway. It was called Mama Lushen, or Mother Tongue, or Yiddish. And it was fantastic. To the left is La Mama, which is actually the place where Tomaszewski got his start, so to speak. And that was a production two years ago of Yiddish marionettes, um, Jenny Romain's troupe in Madakat. And there's a production of Quickle of Hamlin from La Mama when, when Ellen Stewart was still around, right? Uh, and that is the production right below Mandy. To the right is from Yiddish King Lear. And that was at the Metropolitan Playhouse in East 4th Street two years ago. To the right is a Julia Pascal production that was at the Theater for the New City, a redoing of the Dybbuk, which is a story of, of a sort of um, love from beyond the grave and revenge, perhaps also. 
and to the top right is Sholem Ash's God of Vengeance in Yiddish at Wamama, Gatva Nakama. It gets restaged at Wamama because once Paula Vogel has a success on Broadway, it's possible for people in Yiddish theater to actually do a revival which restages that play but uses its original words. And it was very successful. So if I make a pitch today, it's for the resources of the past to be used in the present in terms of shaping futurity. And the richness of this past is present today in the neighborhood. And that is a great legacy for all New Yorkers. I agree so much. Thank well you for this. Very well said. All right. I think we're I think we're good. We're creeping up on two hours. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who stayed with us. We've well, still we've still got 80 people here with us. So wow. that's, that's a gift. <laughs> right. So instead of a poke crawl, we've done a theater crawl. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, thank you. Thank you so, so, so much for this. Um, to all who have asked, and even if you haven't, um, this this recording of this is going to go up on our YouTube probably in the next couple of days. So if you missed it, if you want to forward it to somebody or anything, feel free um, to, to find that there. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Sei gesund. Sei gesund und stark. Be healthy and strong. Bye-bye. Yes.